There's an old Chinese saying, Guilin's hills and water are best under heaven. And looking through the bird's eye view of a drone, they might be right. The karst mountain landscape gives an almost otherworldly sky-fi look. Surely inspiring, modern fiction same as it inspired stories and poems of the Song dynasty. Unsurprisingly, Guilin is one of the top tourist destinations in China. Located about 450 kilometers northeast from Vietnam, and about 1,700 kilometers southwest from Beijing. It is also the home to a pioneering engineering achievement of the Qin Dynasty, which brought much unity and prosperity to the empire. So, how were these incredible mountains formed? What was Qin Shi Huang's crazy project all about? What are the historical highlights of this region? And what is this crazy looking dude doing? Let's roll. Everyone comes here just to see the incredible landscape. The city is often referred to as the capital of Karst because of this. Karst mountains are made of limestone, dolomite and gypsum, which have in common the fact that they are all soluble rocks. Over time, acid breaks down the limestone and creates sinkholes and caverns and subterranean drainage systems where water will flow and collect under the ground. In dramatic instances, karst mountains are created when acidic water wears down limestone bedrock, creating cracks in its surface. Once cracks are formed, water is then able to flow more quickly and with greater force, creating underground drainage paths, which in turn lead to even greater erosion. After millions of years, much of the surrounding rock will be eroded, and with vegetation taking root in the warmer tropical climates in southern China, the erosion process is hastened and limestone mountains are formed. So the creation of all this probably took some 40 million years, with the additional aid of the Indian and Eurasian plates rearranging themselves. So that's for the crazy geography. What about the people? China was not always the unified nation it is today. For most of its existence, it was a loosely bound empire, the borders of which were subject to constant change through invasion, alternating allegiances and rebellions. Nowhere was this more true than in Guangxi, sandwiched between the edges of the Chinese empire to its east, the tribes of Vietnam to its south, and to the west, the ever-changing political situation in what is now Yunnan. The region first became part of China during the Qin dynasty, when in 214 BC, a Han Chinese general claimed most of southern China for Qing Shi Hang. They quickly set out to incorporate the new lands into the empire. But the ancient Chinese were not great road builders. Simple dirt tracks connected much of the empire. Instead, it was the rivers which stepped up as the highways for this empire. We are also told by ancient historians that the emperor sent his commanders to lead forces to fight the tribes of the Yue further to the south. And in order to keep his army supplied and to incorporate the new piece of land, he requested that a massive canal be created, which would help connect the mainland of his empire with the south. The result of this command was the 32 km long Linku Canal, which in itself was not that impressive. But what was impressive is that upon its completion, a trader could set out from Beijing and eventually arrive in what is today modern Hong Kong. So that's an ancient motorway of some 2,000 kilometers and it was the first of its kind. The process of creating this canal wasn't as simple as one might imagine it to be. The problem which had to be overcome was that some of the rivers that needed connecting were flowing in the opposite directions, in particular the river Li and the river Xiang. So the two rivers needed to be tamed and even out before any canals could be dug. The result was the first ever canal which closely follows the contour lines of the land it traversed. So just another way in which the Chinese were technologically ahead of everyone else for thousands of years. The engineering project paid off in a big way. For the next two millennia, much of the north-south imperial and commercial traffic would have to pass through the river Li and past Guiling. As a result, it flourished as a trading outpost and many more towns sprung up around the banks of the river Li. As it turned out, the Song Dynasty was one of China's golden eras, obsessed with moral cultivation and artistic expression, giving Guilin first taste of mass tourism as writers, poets and painters rushed to see its landscape. 
And despite the arrival of the Mongol hordes in 1279 and the fall of the Song, Guilin continued to develop as a popular travel destination. Its commercial importance remained intact right up until the 20th century when rail and road transportation became the dominant means. Even after losing its status as the provincial capital, Guilin remained an important base for the Nationalist Party, one of Chiang Kai-shek's strongholds. As a result, Guilin played a crucial role throughout World War II in Chinese resistance against Japanese invasion. Wartime culture was more literary than political, and it reflected a powerful intellectual vigor that was an indispensable component of China's war efforts. The literary works produced in Guilin between 1938 and 1944 clearly reflected a combination of Chinese national and international anti-fascist and anti-military sentiment. Chinese literary masterpieces were translated into different foreign languages and noted in foreign literature and political works. So as it had always done, Guilin kept inspiring and congregating artists within its sphere of influence. The country as a whole suffered very much in the aftermath of the war, as the Communist Party arrived and wrestled the control of China out of the weakened hands of the nationalists. It was only the 1980s which brought some respite and significant positive reform to the People's Republic of China. Amongst many other legal and political actions intended to modernize China, the government took proactive steps to preserve the geographic and cultural integrity of certain regions. So in 1981, the State Council designated Guilin a culturally and historically protected city. At the time, only three other cities were also granted this protected status. Beijing, Guangzhou and Suzhou. Guilin was quickly groomed up to be one of China's premier tourist destinations. As a result, today Guilin is a relatively small Chinese city with a population of approximately 1.1 million, with little to no industry smog and no skyscrapers to interfere with the view of the landscape. Fishing with cormorant birds is an ancient tradition found in a handful of countries. In China it has been practiced for over a millennium. It's a spellbinding example of human synchronicity with nature. While techniques vary from place to place, hatchlings are usually trained from birth either by socializing with older domesticated birds or through a system of gradual rewards which incentivize them to cooperate with their human masters. Once old enough, a band is carefully placed near the base of the cormorant's throat, which prevents it from swallowing larger fish. Fishermen lure their prey with lights or by agitating the surface of the water. This encourages the birds to dive. The cormorant cuts through the water with remarkable speed and precision. Once a catch is made, the bird instinctively returns to the boat, where the fish is removed, and they are rewarded for their efforts with a lesser prize. Fishing in this way is an ancient tradition. Its exact origins are unknown and subject of a lively historical debate. The first mention anywhere of trained cormorants being used to catch fish is in the Book of Sui, written in 1636 AD, where it describes cormorant fishing in Japan. This was a period of close cultural connection between the two kingdoms, and it is possible that one introduced the practice to the other. Another possibility is that the domestication of cormorants took place independently in China and Japan. That is to say, people in each country had the same idea at roughly the same time. Ultimately, concrete evidence does not exist. Archive footage from 1931 shows scores of fishermen near Guilin their cormorants churning the tranquil waters of the river Li. Yet despite this, cormorant fishing quickly became a dying art. Competition from modern techniques has rendered it obsolete, and a decline in fish population, especially on the Li, has made the practice economically pointless. This 1,300-year-old tradition is now predominantly practiced for its entertainment value to tourists, performed by an ever-decreasing number of elderly men who have been fishing this way their entire lives. It may be largely for our benefit, but the theater of these fishermen and their faithful birds is keeping alive a unique, nearly mythical tradition, making this place that much more magical. Now, have you heard of Kinmen Island? It's a Taiwanese island, and you can literally see China from it. And this is my Patreon map. Here you can see all the super cool dudes who make this show possible. 
Thank you all so very much. If you'd like to lend a hand, then check out my Patreon. Now have a guess where this footage was taken, and I'll see you soon. Geoperspective, out.